that um, he really likes um, animals and, little, and really itty bitty creatures too. Um, so um, I think there's, is there anything else that I'm supposed to say? We're doing the recording and we're gonna, we're gonna we, I think we could start now. And there'll be time for question and answers, right, Alex? Yeah, I'll well, try. And, uh, we have another two minutes of networking. <laughs> we we've been on our, we've been on ahead of time, so we had enough networking. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Alex. All right, so this is going to be a presentation on work that um, basically myself and. Ron Butler, who's the ecological project manager, have been spearheading in Van Crollen Park for around the last, really systematically the last three uh, to four years. And that is to basically go in and find out what's living in the lake within Van Crollen Park and also Tibbetts Brook. Um, because believe it or not, we know a lot of the big things, but the little things that run the world, as Edward Wilson puts it, are um, fairly unknown, undiscovered in urban places. So um, this is an opportunity to make a novel discovery, um, but also have information that we can then utilize in management um, in the future for this uh, all important lake. Um, and so just briefly, some of the topics that we're gonna go over, um, I'm gonna try and make this as entertaining as possible. And if I, well, like a couple of days ago, I droned on for 45 minutes when I meant to do like a 15 minute talk. So we'll see how this goes. I'll be talking about the diversity of BMI, um, basically the different uh, species and varieties that can be found in there, a little bit of their natural history, the applications of their natural history to things like ecological engineering and park management, and then also circle into some of the research um, that we've been doing. Uh, pertaining to the lake and the little things that live inside it. Um, so just diving straight into it, some of the methods that we use um, to actually uh, sample these things, it's a variety. When we first started going into the system, we were using a lot of D-frame dip nets, basically going in, uh, disturbing the sediment at the bottom, and then hauling up whatever we caught inside and sifting through. Um, later, as we moved on, we move towards more of a passive sampling uh, style. So you'll see that picture uh, to the left, which is basically an onion bag um, that's attached to a, to a brick. And inside that onion bag are a bunch of leaves. So you let that sit out in the environment and organisms will go in there for a number of reasons. They're searching for um, biofilms to consume, they're searching for refugia, and if you're a predator, you're searching for the things that are hiding from you inside the leaves. Um, also pictured is this uh, dentimultal bull plate sampler. Um, we find that that gets not as much diversity and really you end up with a lot of just like flatworms and, and snails on there. So if anything to, to suggest uh, just future sampling methods within urban New York City fresh waters, I, I would really promote the, the dip net and also the leaf pack. And then we would use the, um, the freshwater macroinvertebrates in the Northeast of North America by Karski et al. in order to identify uh, these organisms. So jumping right into it, um, we've got bivalves um, within mostly the uh, lake system. So you'll find uh, mussels within the lake um, and then you'll find also clams um, in the lake and in the brook. The clams that are present are the spherium, musculium, and sidium. And then we've also uh, sampled and discovered an anodonta correcta within the, within the system. Um, these are just from a, a functional standpoint are incredibly important because they are filtering. Um, we all probably know about the Billion Oysters project that goes on in larger systems and more estuarine areas of New York City. Um, but we have a lot of fresh water and one thing, one, why not integrate um, and start thinking about how we could actually use uh, their capacity to both um, reduce the turbidity in the system, but also absorb um, nutrients, depositing them into sediments. Um, 
And also their shells actually provide a great deal of heterogeneity and habitat um, at the lake um, floor and at the, the floor of the brook. Um, we also have a bunch of different types of snail species. So the Ficella would be the one that's on the upper left corner. Um, the Planarabella and the Gyrulus are the ram horn shaped ones, so those, those uh, spiral shapes. Um, and then we also have two invasive, or rather um, one non-native and one thought to be invasive, but basically two non-native um, species of snails. Um, that being the banded mystery snail and the Chinese mystery snail. Um, one thing to note is that when we, we do work with the barcode project um, through fields in high school and reports, uh, results from that is saying that it's actually based on the DNA, it's the Japanese mystery snail, which is, a, which is a, a, a closely related species, but is a separate taxa. So into the future, um, really uh, parsing out that taxonomy would be something interesting. What are these snails doing in the environment? Well, they're going around and they're basically uh, foraging on a, a bunch of primary productivity. And they are characteristic of environments that are eutrophic. So when we have um, a lot of nutrients in our system, our snail populations tend to go up. And in terms of the ramifications of these um, non-native species, it's really idiosyncratic at the moment. We don't exactly know if it's positive or negative, and I would uh, love to see more research in the future, especially looking at Sapangulopelodina chinensis or japonica and its, and its effects using uh, mesocosm studies. I think that would be interesting. Or basically just putting them in tanks and uh, messing with the parameters and see what happens, see what their effect is on the rest of the ecosystem. Um, we do have a, a leech community, so the ones that we've been able to determine the taxa have, has been through um, DNA analysis. Um, it gets a little tricky um, identifying these guys by morphology, but the two that we were able to pull out are actually a uh, non-parasitic forms. So I bet everyone thinks that all, pairs, uh, all leeches go around sucking blood, but that's not the case. Um, a small percentage of actually are, are blood feeders. Um, a lot of these guys will actually go around um, eating snails. Um, we do have parasitic species like the, the turtle leech, um, which if you are, are lucky enough to, to get close enough to a snapping turtle or something in the park, if you look at their rear end, there's probably a bunch of uh, leeches hanging off there. But the ones that we typically uh, um, find, which is something that I've just come to learn myself, are actually um, non-blood feeding leeches, and they're uh, sort of feeding mostly on the snail populations, which suggests to me that the, the leeches, which are certainly in high density in some parts of the, the system, could have the capacity to regulate uh, snail populations. We do have two species of crayfish that we were able to pull out. Um, we've their Procamberus acutus and Orchinectes lamosus. This was done um, pretty extensively and systematically uh, two years ago in order to find whether or not we have uh, Orchinectes rusticus or the, the a, a invasive species of uh, crayfish. That was not found in the system, luckily. Um, they're pretty easy to identify. Um, and if you look at the two species, you have Orchinectes on the left. It's a lot more robust and tank-like. And then you have Procamberus acutus, which is the one on the right, um, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, sort of elongated and uh, skinnier species. Um, I have some more information on their population status and ecology later in the presentation. Um, amphipods, so we're going through the crustaceans now. You're also known as scuds or side swimmers. Uh, we've been able to pull out at least three different species. One of them actually thought to be a holdover from when, that's Dexamethia, a holdover from when the system was more estuarine, um, but that's a hypothesis that still needs to be tested. Basically, um, when you're looking at uh, scuds, you could most likely confuse them with isopods, but notice that the legs are directly under the organism 
and they also sort of swim laterally um, on their side. These are important components of basically recycling nutrients, decomposition, and also fish food. So if our, our fisheries and uh, our fish populations are, are um, benefiting from the consumption of these guys. So this is another crustacean. These are isopod sow bugs. Um, we in the, in the Bronx know them as roly-polies. Um, why are roly-polies so prolifically successful in urban environments? I don't know, but it's something to, to definitely look into. We've found two different um, uh, species uh, within the system, but the um, Ciodotia species, that is uh, definitely the, the more dominant of, of them. And basically, just like the um, amphipods, they are helping to recycle nutrients and also acting as an important uh, part of the trophic uh, food web of, of the ecosystem, um, providing lots of nutrients to the fish and other invertebrates that would feed on them. So moving forward to the insects, um, this is probably my favorite group within the, the whole lake. Um, we've got the odonata, the dragonflies and damselflies. Um, I really think as we keep sampling this system, we'll basically get to the point where we're on par with what is found in, in Staten Island. Um, so these are the damselflies. This is the daintier of the two. Um, basically when they, to tell the difference between a damsel and a dragonfly. Damsels are, unless you're a spread wing, you're mostly sitting down with your wings closed together. The dragonflies are sitting with their, their wings open. Um, we have a bunch of bluets, which are in the Analogma genus. Ischnera coleopteryx, which are beautiful jewel wings, mostly found in the upper parts of the Tibbets region. And the ones with the ast are actually the first time this has been uh, found uh, within the Bronx. And that was done um, to compare uh, with species lists from the New York um, damselfly dragonfly survey. These are important predators within the system. So as a larvae, they're consuming um, fly larvae, they're consuming mosquito, mosquito larvae, but also when they emerge, they're, they're important predators. And what we're finding as well is that the type of vegetation and the development of good riparian native vegetation um, really benefits these guys because the more flies, flower flies, um, the more um, native insects that are attracted to flowers, we're providing a, a, um, a prey source for them. So restoration along banks with um, proper native plantings could really uh, be an advantage for, for this group. The larger of the Odonata are the dragonflies. Um, if you've never seen a dragonfly eat as a, as a larvae, I really recommend this going onto YouTube and searching dragonfly larvae um, predation. Um, they basically have this uh, labrum that shoots out, grabs the prey and brings it back into their mandibles. Um, they have the capacity to take down things as large as small minnows and um, tadpoles, which I studied uh, for a little bit. Um, we found um, a bunch of varieties, so things in the darners groups like the Annex junius and the Aishna, um, and also uh, smaller uh, species um, like the uh, Parathemus. Um, and basically, I'd like to think of them as an important part for our health security because with it's been shown that they can consume um, uh, a relatively comparable amount of mosquitoes to things like uh, mosquito fish. Um, so if we lose our dragonfly larvae, I think in our, in our urban areas, in our freshwater systems, we, we are opening ourselves up, I would suggest to, to, uh, to more disease spread through um, vectors such as uh, flies. This is a graph on just research that I published in 2014, I think, um, on the predatory behavior of larval dragonflies. And since this is Earth Day, this sort of circles back into climate change. Uh, basically on the x-axis, you have temperature, 
you have the proportion of tadpoles surviving on the y and then the the graph itself the um the diamond the square and the circle represent different larval dragonfly species so one thing that you can pull out from this is that the aishna um, is actually a much better predator at higher temperatures um, there are there's a species that uh, the ladona didn't basically didn't change and and diddy mops is a slight um uh trend but basically um you have is everyone seeing this green stuff yes <laughs> i don't think that's me <laughs> um so basically you have different species reacting to the same state differently and so when we think about the trajectories that organisms are going to take with climate change it's really operating on a species uh, uh, basis an individual basis so you could have one pond next to another pond they're both warming up depending on what the assemblage the community structure is they can take on two different trajectories so what this I, I think really um, brings home is that when we're trying to look at the um, effects on, on communities, on ecological communities, we need to be looking at multiple species assemblages and not just concentrate on, on single taxa. Now we're gonna move into those um, taxa that are pretty sensitive to um, eutrophic conditions. These are gonna be the EPT, um, so this is the Ephemoptera, the mayflies. Um, we find two different species that really associate with more um, uh, sandy conditions. They, they do like to burrow. Um, and we mostly find them on the shorelines of, of the lake. Um, and we've got two different, Canis and Betis. Uh, the Plecoptera, in terms of our sampling them in the brook and the uh, lake, we have yet to actually pull out a single uh, Plecoptera. Um, the thought is that they are, are probably more sensitive than the, uh, the Canis and the Betids, um, the mayflies. Um, but when I recently started to look at spring systems in, inside the Northwest forest, and there I was able to actually uh, find the first uh, stoneflies. So which suggests to me, um, just think, thinking outside of the, the lake and the brook, that our other freshwater um, ecosystems, such as seeps, fernal pools, springs, these that are isolated from the sewer shed and from the, the inundation of, of road salt, um, it, it has a water quality where we can then um, house these more sensitive organisms. And I really think that one could use stoneflies in stream systems and springs as an indicator of whether or not we could reintroduce salamanders. But that's something uh, for later discussion. Um, and then we have the caddisflies. Um, we pull out, so caddisflies are, can be case-making organisms. So you could see those pictures. You see the big fat grub um, sort of at the bottom and then the case that they make is, is above them. This can be very specific to the species. Um, and the ones that we pull out are typically uh, hydrocycids. So these are net spinners. They're not constructing houses around them made of twigs or mineral material. Um, they're basically using a type of uh, silk and glue to, con uh, to conceal themselves. Um, as water quality moves, uh, gets better and better in New York City, we could expect to see a greater diversity of these caddisflies showing up. But as of right now, we, we are only really finding consistently the hydrocycidae family. Um, these, this is a megaloptera, also known as helgramites. Um, we do run into these guys every now and then, um, but they're, they're actually um, kind of rare. The, um, picture at the bottom is what it metamorphs into, um, an equally uh, scary adult. Um, and these guys are also interesting scavengers and important predators within, within the system. 
Moving on to our true bugs. So what we've been looking at a lot are the larvae of, of insects that would otherwise metamorph and turn to the wing and exit the water. Um, but we also have adult um, invertebrates that sort of both um, live there in the larval stage, but then also live within the habitat um, during their adult stage. And this being uh, one of the representatives of the Hemiptera um, that we find um, fairly consistently is the, um, the giant water bug. So these guys have a big long proboscis that they basically sit with their raptorial appendages waiting for prey. They'll go in and, and venomate um, the, the prey species. Um, and so I, if you're doing um, programs with um, kids or this is one uh, organism you should be aware of for them not to, to handle. And then um, we have the beetles. So I mean, beetles are the most diverse and described animal on the planet. I mean, the numbers keep going up and up every time I look, but it's probably over, you know, it's over 300,000 described species at the moment. Um, and they have really um, colonized all sorts of uh, niches. So we find, uh, basically two different types. Um, the Peltodites, which is the spotted one in the upper right, and then also predaceous diving beetles um, down at the bottom. Um, so these guys, just like the dragonfly larvae, uh, have the capacity to take out larger prey like fish and tadpoles, um, and they're also providing uh, fish at, um, as a food source. Um, and then moving on to the diptera, which are the true flies. So we find that our system is uh, very heavily dominated by um, the chironomids, midge flies, and uh, simulidae black flies. So we definitely find more black flies in the upper reaches of the Tibbetts Brook. As you move more into the lake system, it becomes more and more dominated by uh, chironomids. Um, and anyone who's ever spent any time uh, up north uh, around marshy areas can know how um, much of a pain uh, black flies can be. Um, but the chironomids are non-biting um, midges. Uh, the picture of the chironomid uh, below here is of a chironomus that actually has uh, hemoglobin, um, which allows it to uh, be very efficient at, at, at fixing oxygen, especially in eutrophic systems where oxygen levels can dip down and become anoxic. Um, so moving forward, I'm just gonna quickly talk about, um, so the, that was basically the, the usual suspects list of kind of what we are, uh, if you go in with a net, you'll typically pull out, um, but to a little bit higher resolution of taxonomy um, than is normally seen. So we also, do um, a lot of quantitative research. So when we first went in, we wanted to just get a species list. Okay, let's familiarize ourselves with what's there. And now that we've kind of done that, we can now move to more um, quantitative assessment of the community. Um, so basically this is the ultimate overarching question that we're trying to answer with our research. The study area was um, go, uh, is depicted in the map. The yellow um, outline is the watershed of Tibbetts Brook. Um, the sampling sites are highlighted and noted as letters um, going south from, from A to I. Uh, there are nine sampling sites in total, and we were able to sample in the months listed, February, March, April, May, July, October. Um, and we used the leaf pack method. So I placed two leaf packs at, at each site. Um, so you could see that there's a basically a large spatial extent. Um, we recently moved out of the park to do our uh, water quality sampling, and that has allowed us to uh, not only um, have sites that have different surrounding land uses, um, so for instance, at the northern part, um, there's more reg residential. As you come down, you're paralleling highways. You then enter the park system at site E. Um, and there are drastic changes to the, the physical parameters 
and also um, the uh, chemistry um, that we also uh, collect data on. And so this gives us a really awesome uh, spatial and temporal extent through all those months to look at how the community changes and are we able to actually predict those changes. Um, I apologize for the bottom being slightly cut off here, but the take home message, these are all new um, graphs I'm producing now. Um, the take home message is that our system across all those sites, all those months, is basically dominated by gamarity. So those are the, um, the uh, amphipods, um, the chironomids, the simulidae, which are the black flies, coenongridae, which are the damselflies, and physids, which are snails. So we're really looking at a crustacean fly, damselfly, snail sort of dominated community which is fairly typical for um, uh, urban systems. But one thing to note is that other studies that used other methods, so dip netting, really pull out and end up with a lot of worms dominating their system, oligochaetes. Um, using the leaf pack method, uh, we found that we actually end up with a lot more um, gamarity, the crustaceans, chironom and simulids, damselflies, and snails. So based on a uh, rarefaction analysis, so this is basically accumulation curve, um, we are at, the taxa is at the level of the family. So we were able to um, basically get 25 families identified through our sampling effort across the nine sites. And based on 95% confidence intervals, this predicts that there are still an estimated five more families uh, to be uncovered. Um, so, there, so just based on statistical assessment, we have yet to really um, totally flatten off that curve. Um, so once that curve gets flattened, we're no longer accumulating um, different types of families. And although it is starting to flatten off, um, it, there's still an estimated still things to discover. Which, which I'm happy about. So this is basically a very complicated way of looking at uh, associations of species. A big take home from this is that organisms that tend to do fare better in uh, polluted systems tend to cluster together. Um, also, interestingly, if you look over here, that the canids, which are the barren, the burrowing mayflies, and the, uh, the these are aquatic earthworms, these are burrowing taxa, and so they're sort of in this ordination space, very closely clustered together. So not only is this possibly unveiling um, certain water quality classes, but it also may be mapping the the niche associations, um, and so. One other way of interpreting it is this. So for instance, if you find uh, a um, crayfish, Camberity, you are also likely to find a ram's head snail in, in that same pack. So there, we, I still want to test to see if these associations are non-random or not, uh, but it looks like there might be some actual structure to the community in terms of patterns of co-occurrence. This basically looks at sites, looks at all the nine sites, and categorizes them based on what species are present. And so if you're familiar with evolutionary biology, um, this is sort of like a phylogenetic tree. And so those sites um, that are close together on this tree are more compositionally similar in terms of what is present. Um, and what this has showed is that site B is an outlier. And when you actually look at the phosphorus and nitrogen uh, nitrate concentrations um, they, of site B, it's also a serious significant outlier. So one thing that we wanted, what this is showing us is that, okay, maybe um, when you have a certain amount of phosphorus or nitrogen in the system, you get a kind of a unique uh, community present. And also we found about three different aggregates. Um, so one could actually think of this as, this is sort of unveiled basically three to four different community types 
of associations of different um, vertebrates within the system. Um, so I did work a couple, um, like two years ago, on a more systematic look at crayfish in the population and also started to look at their morphology. So I'm just going to give just a quick results on that. So basically what we found is that Procambrus acutus, which was that longer, um, skinnier crayfish, accounted for about 87% of the, the capture. Orconectes lamosus, only about 13%. And so what this um, suggests is that we, if there is a competitive exclusion going on between these two species, one might think that pro, uh, or we may lose Orconectes um, from the system right. um, just based on how uh, dominant um, Procambrus is. Um, to the right, looking at the, the graph, we measured the cross-sectional area of the brook um, at different trapping sites and then um, counted the abundance of crayfish within the trap. Um, I don't have the regression lines on here, but if you look at the orange one, which is P. acutus, it's a fairly good, um, I mean, it's a, uh, positive uh, uh, trend going on. Um, and the, the, uh, it's different than the um, Orconectes. So what this is suggesting is that there actually might be niche segregation going on. And secondly, that a understanding the geometry of the of the system can also be an important factor. Um, so we, we do a lot looking at uh, water quality, um, but things like the shape, um, the depth, and the 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 angles of, of the actual um, of the banks these physical parameters are also important. And as we push forward to try and daylight this um, Tibbetts Brook system, thinking about optimal cross-sectional areas of the engineered uh, brook uh, to house uh, and increase biodiversity is something to, to really think about. So John and I kept crayfish in our apartment in Queens in a tank. And what I started to notice is that they started to shift their color within about a week. And not only were they shifting their color, they were shifting their color towards it seemingly to match the color of the substrate they were on. So I was like, all right, this is interesting. Let me see if I can get a Manhattan College student to, to be crazy enough to pursue this. And I was lucky enough that I was able to uh, find someone enthusiastic enough uh, to deal with uh, crayfish. So basically we had um, tubs that were all white sand and tubs that were all black sand. We developed the crayfish in them for two weeks. These were wild crayfish caught from, uh, from Tibbetts Brook. And as you can see, the, the picture uh, below, I'm still analyzing this and, and try and find ways of actually quantifying this. But from a qualitative standpoint, can you guys tell me which one was raised on the black sand and which one was on the white? I mean, it's kind of apparent, right? So the yeah. one on the left was on the black sand and then the one on the, the right was laid on the white sand. So it does seem that there is some potential for uh, crayfish to actually be plastic in their uh, color, in their morphology, and be able to shift towards substrate color. Um, in terms of this showing up in the literature, I know for a fact that this was the first time in this species this was ever demonstrated. And there, it, there was an old paper from like, I don't know, the early 1900s that suggested this in another species. Um, so this is something that I would love to find other students of Manhattan College to flush this out uh, because it, when we do, we'd be the first, uh, I think, the first to actually demonstrate this. And it would be nice to do this in a wide array of species. Nice. Um, and then we also, thinking about um, freshwater mussel filtration study, um, we did this also in Dr. Um, Jessica Wilson's lab with graduate students and undergrads. Um, so we are 
all about integrating um, students into the research that we're doing because I feel like that's a, a fundamental way of learning um, about how to do science through actually doing it. So basically we had different container, uh, containers and we placed a single muscle within each container. The containers were spiked either with clay to make it more uh, turbid or phosphorus um, and then left for a, a certain period and measurements were made over a time series to look at either reduction, no change or an increase. Um, if you look at the turbidity graph, um, you can see that there is a significant um, mm -hmm. reduction in turbidity just by a single muscle mm -hmm. in a very short period of time. Um, so think about a population of muscles over an even longer period of time, um, what that could potentially do to the system. And then we also looked at um, the removal of phosphorus. Um, so that's a little bit more idiosyncratic and be able to tell, but as far as um, what we were able to show is that they are capable of doing this, but in terms of fleshing this out from an ecological engineering point of view, we would likely want to couple this with other organisms. So it's not just the muscles, we would likely need to understand the role of bacteria and 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 algae and, and the primary production and also the absorption of, of, of nutrients in combination with these uh, muscles. And so that is the end. <laughs> Huge. Um, basically, uh, would like to acknowledge a bunch of people. Um, uh, John, Christina, Sarah, Dr. Jesser, Park Gambino, um, volunteers, especially uh, Benny, I forgot his last name, I'm so sorry, and Felicity. <laughs> um, and then um, also uh, really students that have recently been um, a good help in helping me pick through leaf packs and, and look for bugs. And we'd also like to thank the, the DC um, for um, providing funding for this. Very nice. Clap, everybody clap. Congratulations, congratulations. Yes, very nice. Very nice. So do we have any questions? I have nobody who put a question in the chat room. We were so mesmerized with your presentation. It was excellent. Thank you. We have... Um, uh, oh, I had a question. Okay. Unmute me. You're unmuted. I can't... Oh, okay. In the ones, uh, I think it was of the diving beetles, or can you go back to those? There was one on the bottom, a picture that looked like it was covered with eggs. Oh, that was the hemiptera. 